question or call the WGA office at 303-623-9378. Before I introduce our moderator, I'd like to take a moment to discuss the WGA Species Conservation and ESA Initiative and go over a few logistical details for the webinar. Uh, the Western Governor Species Conservation Initiative is the uh, initiative chairman, um, Governor Matt Mead of Wyoming. Through the initiative, WGA uh, hopes to create a framework for states to share best practices in species management, promote and elevate the role of states in species conservation efforts, and explore ways to improve the efficacy and efficiency of the Endangered Species Act. The initiative will examine ESA to determine what is working and what's not, and go beyond that to highlight innovations related to species man management and conservation, as well as consider means by which state resources can be better leveraged. Before we begin, I would like to discuss the structure of the webinar. Um, today we are joined by our moderator, Matt McKinney, Director for the Center, of Natu Center for Natural Resources and Environmental Policy at the University of Montana. He will, be, he will begin by sharing some of his thoughts on landscape level management and introduce the panelists. After this, each, each panelist will give, a brief, will give brief opening remarks. Following those remarks, Matt will then ask a few questions of the panelists as part of the moderated discussion portion. Following the moderated discussion amongst panelists, we will have an open question and answer session open to all attendees. All general attendees are currently on mute, so please write your questions in the chat box and be sure that you have addressed your question to me, Bill Whitaker. We will have a recording of the webinar available on the WGA website, so by tomorrow afternoon, Wednesday, this April 6th. Again, if anyone needs technical assistance, please message Amy Schweig or give WGA a call at 303-623-9378. And with all that being said, I would like to things, turn things over to our moderator, Matt. Uh, thank you, Bill, very much, um, and welcome everyone to what we expect will be uh, informative and hopefully a spirited uh, webinar. Uh, Bill, I'm assuming the sound is working, so I'll keep an eye on the chat box uh, if I get a note from you that it's not working. So uh, as we begin, I just want to do a special uh, thanks and shout out to the WTA staff for all the behind the scenes work that they've completed to pull together this webinar and the series of web webinars on this topic. And of course, a special thanks to Governor Matt Mead for his leadership on this critical issue of species conservation and the Endangered Species Act. Um, as Bill indicated, I'll serve as moderator for the webinar today, which for the most part means I'm going to try and keep the trains running on time, make sure that all of our panel members have an opportunity to share their experiences uh, and to highlight best practices, and then to ask as many questions as possible from uh, our audience. Before I review the agenda again and, and introduce and turn this over to our panel members for their opening remarks, I want to say a few words just about my background and orientation. Uh, in part, I hope to help frame our discussion this morning. I've uh, worked as an environmental mediator for over 25 years, and I've had the opportunity to work on land, water, wildlife, and almost every other natural resource issue uh, important to people in the American West. Over the past Ten years or so, I've had the opportunity to focus much of my attention on the role of regional, multi-jurisdictional, multi-sector, large, landsc large landscape conservation initiatives to achieve a variety of objectives, including species conservation uh, and restoration. Uh, in partnership with countless individuals and organizations, we produce the three publications that you see on the PowerPoint there. Uh, that highlight lessons learned as well as challenges for the future. You can go to the next slide there. In 2012 and 2013, we convened a series of workshops and completed some research to document the status and trends of large landscape conservation in the eight Rocky Mountain states. And obviously, I don't have time to review all the results of that project, so I would encourage you to track it down and give it a quick read. And what I'd like to do is uh, take the time to make really two sort of basic points about the, the results of that work. First, uh, the 125 initiatives included in the study reflect an interesting and I think healthy trend in natural resources problem solving. The initiatives vary in terms of size or geographic scale, purpose and objectives, leadership, and governance. In other words, there's no single model. How these inputs influence outcomes and performance, however, is still a bit of an open question and a topic 
uh, at least that I hope we get into this morning a little bit. You can go to the next uh, slide. Uh, the second point I want to make has to do with the objectives of these initiatives. As this bar chart uh, illustrates, over 80 of the initiatives studied, or about 65% of them, focus on habitat and species conservation. So there's much to learn by looking more closely at some or perhaps all of these initiatives. The other important observation that emerges from this bar chart and the study more generally is that large landscape conservation initiatives rarely focus on a single issue, such as species conservation, but are multi-objective and realize the need to address multiple issues and multiple interests to arrive at effective, durable solutions. So uh, you can go to the next slide, which uh, uh, is basically just the agenda again, as Bill indicated. So um, what we're going to do now is uh, proceed to opening remarks. Each of our panel members uh, will have about five minutes or so uh, to provide opening remarks uh, at the top of the hour, about 11 o'clock. Uh, we'll then proceed to a moderated discussion uh, where I will be asking questions of the panel members based on their presentations and also based on some questions we generated prior to the webinar. At about 11.30 or so, uh, we'll start uh, asking panel members questions that you, the audience members, uh, send to the WGA staff, and then we'll try and wrap things up by uh, noon. Okay? So with that, uh, just sort of an opening remark and sort of framing of the discussion a little bit, I want to turn to our first panel member, John Sweat, for his opening remarks. Uh, John is the program manager for the Lower Colorado River Multi-Species Program. John? Thanks, Matt. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear me as I push all these mute buttons and try to get on here. Uh, as Matt mentioned, my name is John Sweat. I'm the program manager of the Lower Colorado River Multi-Species Conservation Program, or the LCR MSCP as it's known. Uh, next slide, please. The LCR MSCP is a multi-stakeholder federal and non-federal partnership that provides the Endangered Species Act compliance for operating the Lower Colorado River. Next slide. So the LCR MSCP is a unique hybrid ESA compliance program that provides uh, ESA Section 7 compliance for federal agencies and Section 10 compliance for non-federal agencies. Uh, the partners, or permittees as we call them, get their incidental take authorization, uh, what's normally referred to as your ESA permit, uh, through the completion of conservation measures described in a Habitat Conservation Plan, or HCP. And this is for 26 covered species Seven of those covered species are currently listed on the federal ESA as either endangered or threatened, but 19 are not currently listed. Now, funding is a 50-50 cost share between the federal government and the non-federal permittees. Uh, the 50% federal cost share comes from the Bureau of Reclamation, as the Bureau of Reclamation is the lead implementing agency for the MSCP. Uh, and the non-federal cost share, um, half of that comes from California entities, a quarter comes from Nevada entities, and a quarter from Arizona entities. The MSCP is designed to offset impacts of covered actions, and these actions include the delivery of 9 million acre feet of water, so that's Arizona, California, Nevada, and Mexico's allocation from the Colorado River the generation of power from six facilities. That includes Hoover Dam, Davis Dam, and Parker Dam. Uh, maintenance activities associated with operating the river, uh, bank line stabilization, dredging, all of those types of activities. And the movement of up to 1.574 million acre feet change in point of diversion, and that has become very important as we deal with a 15 year plus drought here in the Southwest. Next slide, please. 
The LCR MSCB planning area extends from the lower Grand Canyon to the southerly international boundary with Mexico. So it's about 400 miles of the Colorado River. Next slide. The partnership is comprised of 57 different entities, federal agencies, state agencies, water agencies, power contractors, municipalities, Native American tribes and non-governmental organizations are all part of the MSCP Steering Committee. Next slide. The MSCP is considered to be one of the most effective large-scale conservation programs in the world and is actually being looked at uh, at the Department of Interior level as a model for doing ESA compliance in the future. Uh, there's a number of reasons why this program has been so successful, but the main reason and the one I really want to point out is that the steering committee has stayed actively involved in this program since it started in 2005. And the main reason why is because they have a stake in its success. So there are 57 different entities within it. There are six federal agencies, but there are 51 non-feds. And 41 of those 51 get their ESA compliance from that, this program. And that is one reason why they are actively involved in how we implement the program. Uh, if you want more information, I have the uh, website up on this slide. Uh, you're more than welcome to, to um, get on our web and, and see what we're up to. Uh, this is a very transparent program. We put all our decision documents, all our meeting notes, our technical and scientific reports all go up on the web for everybody to see. So with that, um, thank you, and I look forward to uh, participating in the conversation this morning. Great. Thanks, John. That's a terrific start and obviously an unbelievably ambitious uh, effort, and so we'll uh, look forward to sort of diving into that a little bit more here in a few minutes. Um, the next panel member is Alexa Sandoval. Um, Alexa is the director of the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish. Alexa, go ahead. Great. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate it. Um, before I actually get started, I, I do want to acknowledge Governor Mead and uh, the Western Governors Association for the opportunity to engage in conversations around the ESA, uh, the Endangered Species Act because it is such a large part of what we do uh, on a daily basis here uh, in the state of New Mexico, and I'm sure for my fellow Western states. So I appreciate the opportunity uh, to participate. So I'm just going to dive right in and uh, became director about two years ago for the department. And um, as a state director that manages wildlife in mostly a desert environment, I quickly realized that developing and maintaining partnerships uh, with those interested and charged with uh, managing natural resources uh, within the state boundaries was incredibly important. Um, and, that, and that is due in large part to the fact that we are confronted on a regular basis and as I stated earlier, probably on a daily basis if not hourly basis with making decisions uh, management decisions that are greatly influenced by other limited natural resources like water. Um, and quite simply, our wildlife management decisions uh, are influenced by our understanding of the capacity of our landscapes to hold and maintain our wildlife populations. And that capacity, of course, is also affected by socioeconomic, other natural resource and statutory factors. Um, as you all can imagine, navigating just one of those factors alone is a heavy lift, but as a state wildlife agency managing all of those factors, we're required to do that, and there's probably some out there I haven't even recognized. Um, so it makes it tough uh, to operate in an environment when you don't have partnerships and you don't have relationships that you can go to uh, both at federal, state, and private levels. And so that's why I believe uh, managing and developing partnerships is the key to success uh, for managing our natural resources uh, here in the desert southwest. 
but particularly as it relates to managing those species uh, as listed under the Federal Endangered Species Act. Um, for those of you who are familiar and have heard this before, uh, Section 6 of the Endangered Species Act specifically calls on the Secretary of the Department of Interior uh, to cooperate to the maximum extent practicable with the states. Um, and I think this singular sentence emphasizes the need and the importance for establishing uh, relationships, uh, successful relationships on the ground that will positively influence the recovery of species that are federally listed. Without these relationships, uh, the ability for us to manage and for the species uh, to become delisted uh, almost becomes non-existent. And I say non-existent because there has to be a concerted effort by all of those impacted uh, by the listing of a species to participate in a recovery program. It can't solely be a recovery plan that was forced upon a wildlife management agency or land managers or the users of the resource. It really must be a cooperative effort with true partnerships um, in which dialogue from all of the impacted user groups uh, can engage and, and be heard and solutions are actively sought uh, by the agency, by the listing agency, and in my case, the, the Fish and Wildlife Service. Additionally, you know, partnerships are, are great to establish, but there's also some fiscal resources uh, that have to be brought to bear uh, on the issue uh, for a recovery plan. Um, and I believe the current dedication of uh, current federal financial resources uh, to the recovery of those listed species is somewhat inadequate. Um, and so if we truly want to delist species as called for under the Endangered Species Act, uh, we really need the opportunity to have um, those relationships but also have the financial backing to make that happen. Um, as John talked about earlier, there are opportunities and species uh, where strong partnerships do exist uh, in the Western uh, United States, and one of which I'm very proud to be a part of is the Lesser Prairie Chicken Rangewide Conservation Plan. Um, the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies took on uh, the effort of developing this initiative. Um, and the partnerships that have resulted uh, from, that part, from that initiative are tremendous. We're partnering with uh, livestock producers, with industries such as oil and gas. We work with um, non-governmental organizations such as the PF and um, the Nature Conservancy, and the list of partnerships goes on, the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. And so the ability to formulate strong relationships is there and we see it um, with the range-wide plan. We also see it uh, with our partnership with the recovery of the, the Rio Grande cutthroat trout up in uh, north central New Mexico and south central Colorado. So it's possible. It takes quite a bit of work um, because you are constantly working on uh, developing new uh, relationships and partnerships. Um, and I believe in an absence of those partnerships or an unwillingness to form them uh, as called for under the Section 6 of the ESA, it will only perpetuate the inability to recover species. Uh, so it's very important for all of us to get engaged. I don't, I don't believe we all have to agree uh, on everything all the time, but we must be able to step forward and develop those partnerships so that we can be successful in implementing um, recovery out there on the ground in, in, our, in the Western uh, United States. So that wraps it up for me. I will pass the torch. Thank you, Alexa. Terrific. Um, I definitely want to come back and talk more about this question or the challenge and the key ingredient of relationship building, and so we'll, we'll get back to that here in a few minutes. Um, our third uh, panel member is Jim DeVos. Jim is the Assistant Director uh, for wildlife management with the Arizona Game and Fish. And Jim, I hope, uh, I hope the system, the webinar system here is working now for you. Well, we're about to test it and find out. <laughs> Very uh, good. Well, good morning all. Uh, I'd like to follow up on one of the things that Alexa said and, 
and certainly want to thank Governor Mead in particular, but also the, the all of the governors in the Western Governors Association for their steadfast look at the impact of Endangered Species Act on uh, resource management. And when I say resource management, I mean not only wildlife, but uh, raison producers on a working landscape, uh, people that recreate and, and enjoy our great outdoors. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the unintended uses as we go through this. I think when Congress developed the Endangered Species Act, uh, the intent certainly was to bring public awareness to the issue of declining wildlife populations, uh, declining plant populations, and to begin to build a protective mechanism by which uh, these species could be recovered. When I talk about some of the unintended uses, um, looking as far back as the snail darter in the Teleco Dam scenario, uh, that was one of the first instances where litigation tested the intent of the Endangered Species Act. It was the first, but it's clearly not the last. And we'll talk about some of the bigger issues in, in a moment. But suffice to say that much of the uh, application of the endangered species today is done through the justice system and not using professional wildlife sciences. Uh, next slide, please. The desert tortoise, uh, and there's, a, I think, a couple of, uh, if you hit return, uh, there's some additional language there, I believe. So <clears throat> the Sonoran desert tortoise is a good example of an animal that, that we're challenged to manage in the desert environment. Uh, it is widespread and abundant through Arizona. The population levels are in the millions. Uh, it also occurs in some of the states in Mexico. So in 2012, as part of the multi-district litigation, the, uh, some litigants petitioned the service to list the Sonoran Desert Tortoise. And I go back to what I said a moment ago of, of, of populations of millions. Uh, having been involved in wildlife resource management in uh, the Southwest for four decades, when I think of endangered species, I think of things like the Mexican wolf that started with a population of seven. Uh, today we have almost 100 in, on the landscape. Those are the type of numbers that seemingly to me warrant protection under ESA. But through a simple petition process, uh, over 1,200 species were requested to be listed or to be evaluated for listing, including the desert tortoise. There was uh, also suits filed by uh, environmental litigants asking the uh, service, asking the court to review the failure of the Fish and Wildlife Service to make determinations on 70 species. Now, uh, working for an agency if I were faced with trying to manage and make a determination on 70 species at one time, I could well imagine that would be incredibly challenging. So the point of what I'm trying to make is, is that the process for managing wildlife in a desert landscape is complicated in one hand by the ability for petitions to list in mass. Uh, again, the multi-district litigation nationally asked for 1,200 species to be evaluated, and, and it really effectively chokes all of the regulatory system to the point that, that really having adequate review and making reasonable determinations is very, very difficult. Next slide, please. We have another species that uh, we're working with right now, it's the round tail and, and headwater chub. Uh, they too were uh, petitioned to be listed by uh, 
environmental litigants in the part of the 2012 multi-district litigation. Um, again, as I said a moment ago, when you have 1,200 species to look at all the scientific data that uh, are available on numbers and distribution, and on these two particular species, uh, there's significant questions on taxonomy. Um, it, it takes our federal partners uh, into an arena that they are challenged to fully comply with the intent of the ESA, um, to, and they challenge to use the best available science, and they're challenged to take a hard look at the need for listing. Uh, both the Sonoran Desert Tortoise and the Chubb Complex, the Arizona Game and Fish Department has spent decades uh, gathering data, and, and in our opinion, uh, the species don't warrant listing. But again, because of the listing in mass, it makes it difficult for partners to effectively uh, do their jobs efficiently. And the end result is that a judge that's trained in law is now making the decisions for uh, on biological issues that should be left to the professional wildlife science to, to make those determinations. Next slide, please. There are tools that we have. Earlier we heard about the multi-species uh, conservation plan, the MSCP, uh, for the lower Colorado River. And, and the slide that you have in front of you, um, the CCA, which is a candidate conservation agreement, and the CCAA are both tools that have been used uh, as pre-listing conservation attempts. Uh, we have both a CCA and a CCAA for the Sonoran Desert Tortoise. In the case of the, my screen just went blank for a second. In the, in the case of the tortoise, um, to move forward in, in evaluating the protective measures of the conservation that's in place, uh, every federal agency that has either Wildlife Management Authority or Land Management Authority signed on to the CCA. The CCAA is more designed for private entities. Uh, we are finalizing that and starting to enroll people into the Candidate Conservation Agreement. Uh, one of the key things in managing desert systems, um, and, and I believe managing wildlife resources everywhere, uh, is to keep species off the endangered species list. Uh, recovery of, of a listed species is far more difficult than uh, implementing conservation, effective conservation. Earlier, you heard Director Sandoval talk about the lesser prairie chicken. Uh, that's a testimony for the power of some of these pre-listing agreements and the power of partnerships uh, that can affect very broad scale landscapes and implement uh, effective conservation for the different species. Next slide, please. And I'll wrap up uh, my discussion about some of the efforts that are ongoing uh, right now. Certainly, uh, Governor Meade, as we spoke about before, is leading an effort through Western Governors Association to uh, look at some elements of ESA reform. The Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, which is a uh, parent organization of the 50 state wildlife agencies, has also uh, a legal staff looking at changes in ESA. And I think recognizing the, the value of the Endangered Species Act and the, the original congressional intent Broad scale changes to the Endangered Species Act is, is probably not feasible in today's environment and probably not warranted. Uh, some of the changes that, that we're looking at, uh, both through Western Governors and, and OFWA and, and some of the other organizations, are small scale changes, uh, certainly clarifying the role of Section 6, uh, which as Director Candival said, one of the powerful tools for the state wildlife agencies that brings us to uh, 
the same level of decision making as the Fish and Wildlife Service or federal government in endangered species. Uh, clarifying that role that the states play is, is part of what we need. Also, I think getting, uh, moving away from the ability to use uh, listings in mass. Uh, I spoke earlier about the multi-district litigation. Uh, we call that multi-district litigation one. The, a number of entities are now working on multi-district litigation two, which will again bring hundreds of species into the uh, review process for the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service to make determinations and crammed into a very short time frame uh, with strict legal uh, response times makes it very, very difficult for them to comply with the intent of ESA to take a hard look at the science and bring the best available science to bear. So um, ESA in itself is a valuable tool. Uh, determinations by judicial review is one of the uh, points that we deal with on nearly a daily basis. Uh, and clearly, uh, some minor modifications to ESA to bring more structure and, and bring more science and bring a higher role for the state wildlife agencies, which typically have the bulk of the data on, on these local species. Those are, are ESA reforms that we think are, are very valuable. And with that, I'll wrap up what my uh, discussions were. Terrific, thank you, um, Jim. That's really wonderful. I mean, you put a lot of uh, challenges uh, on the table for us to consider, so thank you very much for that. Um, before I introduce our fourth and final panel member, Bill McDonald, let me just remind the audience uh, members to begin thinking about and sending us uh, questions through the uh, webinar system. Uh, so that we can uh, uh, hear what you're thinking and get the uh, this excellent panel to respond to some of your thoughts and questions. Um, so we've we've heard from John Swat, uh, program manager for basically a federal program. So we have that federal perspective on this question, and then from Alexa and Jim, more from the state perspective. And so our fourth panel member, Bill McDonald is the executive director of the Malpai Borderlands Group, which is a nonprofit uh, organization um, that is focused on these and, and similar issues. So I think it'll have nicely round out uh, the conversation here in terms of different perspectives. So with that, uh, Bill, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, um, I'm just on the phone, so you're not gonna see any slides or anything, and I apologize for that, but um, um, I'm, uh, I'm a fifth generation uh, cattle rancher on the same ranch in southeastern Arizona, a little bit new, in uh, southwestern New Mexico, and I'm a co-founder and the executive director of a, a group that began 20 years ago um, when uh, ranchers were looking for um, common ground with folks from the environmental community. Uh, we got all the agencies involved, and we've been at this for about 20 years. And the idea was not to be focused on endangered species. Uh, the idea was to try to do a couple of things that we agreed on. We wanted to get the grasslands um, back on an upward trend again uh, and, and uh, get the habitat in a more healthy condition than it was at the time. And we also uh, wanted to try to keep a subdivision uh, out of the area, which was breaking up a lot of the open space and wildlife corridors and certainly impacting the, the ranching um, and this was a very contentious time. Uh, there was a lot of efforts to try to um, uh, end ranching, certainly on public uh, lands. And um, it, it, was, it was a tough time to begin, but we've carried forward. And like I say, we've been at this for 20 years. Um, endangered species was not our focus, but it wasn't something that couldn't be ignored either. And interestingly enough, um, a lot of times, uh, we, we encountered endangered species issues when we were trying to do something different, when we were trying to actually move the landscape in what we felt was a, a positive direction. And by we, I mean the agencies as well as the landowners and, and the environmental folks. Um, we'd run headlong into issues, uh, especially around prescribed burning, having to do with uh, Mexican long-nosed bat, originals, rattlesnake, among other things. 
Um, we also uh, had a jaguar wander through there, and a, and a photograph was taken by one of the ranchers. Uh, it was the first time a, a jaguar had ever been photographed in the wild. There, subsequently, there were some other uh, photos taken in uh, other parts of southern Arizona, so we came to know that there were male jaguars that came from their core habitat 150 miles south, would would come up through the area. And we, in running into these difficulties with uh, endangered species, we decided uh, to put together a, a habitat conservation plan of all the species of concern, uh, everything that we could think of, uh, to try to uh, um, not necessarily mitigate, but to try to avoid taking any actions which might be detrimental to individual species. And it took us four years with uh, all the agencies involved and representatives from uh, for the landowners. And, and uh, at the end of four years, we came out with a plan. And interestingly enough, the Jaguar was not included in the plan. And at that time, the head of ecological services in Arizona said that over my dead body would there ever be critical habitat for the jaguar because there just isn't any. That was his remark and the other folks at the table all agreed with that. So in spite of, you know, the ranchers saying we really ought to have the jaguar in this plan, there's no, it doesn't make any sense, there's no critical habitat, there's really no habitat for the jaguar up here. Well, lo and behold, um, of course the center for biological uh, diversity sued, and a judge said, you know, why isn't there critical habitat? He wasn't satisfied with the answers that the agencies gave, or I should say the Fish and Wildlife Service gave. And so now we do have critical habitat in our area as well as some others. Uh, whether it is actually critical habitat or not, politically it is critical habitat. And needless to say, the head of ecological services, a very good guy and a friend of mine, is still walking around, so his prognostication wasn't too good there. But um, we, um, you know, this is this is one of the frustrating things: is that you go through a process and you try hard to do the right thing, and then somebody comes from the outside and is able to litigate and get something else done in spite of what the best science is telling you. Um, we've had an opportunity to uh, opt out. Of, of the critical habitat for our particular area because of all the work that we've done, uh, including setting up a fund to reimburse anyone who has a take from Jaguars. We decided not to opt out because we don't really want a target on our back and, and be uh, an object of, uh, or target for litigation, I should say. So uh, I could go through several other instances where we've run into this problem of of outside litigation after we've gone through a process, but I, but I, I think where 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 we have seen some real success was in the area of the Chiricahua leopard frog, where there was no controversy involved. Everybody knew that the, the frog populations were crashing. We had a, a ranch family that voluntarily was hauling water to a tank that was drying up to keep a population alive. We got uh, some money through Arizona Game and Fish Department to, to actually drill a well to supplement that water and also make water available for their cattle at the same time. The first uh, hole that we drilled turned out to be completely dry, and they came back and drilled another one, which I have to hand it to the agency for sticking with us. And um, we've, we've uh, expanded that effort into a habitat that existed in New Mexico where we worked with uh, some specialists on on uh, trying to improve uh, water courses uh, and and hold up water and make a more permanent habitat for for leopard frogs over there and and by and large the Chiricahua leopard frog is thriving in our area where leopard frog populations are crashing and many others so that's been a real success and hasn't involved any litigation just a number of people trying to do the right thing. So I would say that you know a collaborative effort is certainly helpful when you're trying to engage these issues, but it's not a panacea. You still run into the problems that everybody else does with uh, folks with other agendas uh, kind of trying to steal the show, so to speak. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll wrap up and, and, uh, and, go, and uh, go on from here. Great. Thank you, Bill. Again, thanks to all four uh, members of the panel. Um, 
And so, again, a real quick uh, suggestion for the audience members to please start sending in some questions, thoughts, questions. Um, so let me start with, uh, I'm going to try and formulate a question that seems to me one of the, the common themes with all four presentations is, uh, as Alexa sort of framed it, this issue of relationships. And I want to try and sort of frame a question around the importance of relationships. How do we build and maintain relationships, whether it's public, private, NGO, the multiple stakeholders that uh, have an interest in these issues? But, but also sort of think about, Jim, from your perspective, the frustration and, uh, well, I guess the frustration of these petitions in mass that effectively, in a way, hijack, I think you sort of said hijack the administrative process in such a way that doesn't allow for good science to prevail, nor does it allow for professional resource managers to play the role that we need them to play in many ways in terms of making decisions, and that those decisions then ultimately fall on the desk uh, of judges uh, and the court system. And again, I think as we're sort of thinking through through this, um, obviously recognizing that there is a role for the court, there is a role for litigation and all this, and so we're not so much belittling that as trying to maybe put it in some proper perspective. And then I think, Bill, you sort of added to that sort of sense of frustration and the, and the challenge of even if we do design and manage and engage in the right sort of collaborative process, the right people in as much as we know are at the table, we use the best available science, that oftentimes there are outsiders who, uh, I guess you can use that term, who come in and, you know, don't support the process or the outcome and then use the courts in litigation. And so maybe, Alexa, if I could start with you to just sort of reflect on how do we make sure we have the right people at the table? How do we build, I mean, this currency of relationships, how do we build that and maintain that? And in particular, Given that these processes, these collaborative sort of partnerships, they take time, right? Whether it's four years or longer, and so people people come and go, individuals come and go. And so, how do we build and maintain those relationships and partnerships? So maybe start with Alexa, and then I'd like to, if others want to join in on that question, uh, and see where we go with that. So, Alexa, any thoughts? Uh, yeah, I, I thank you, Matt. I appreciate uh, the question and. It's one that I've thought a lot about, <clears throat> particularly uh, now in the last two years. I think there's two very important points. One uh, that you you know hit the nail right on the head. These relationships are long lasting. Um, they, they need to be long lasting. Uh, they need to have a strong foundation. And so when you <clears throat> develop a relationship based on you know, well, we'll just give you or what you want to hear or kind of placate, those aren't sustainable relationships. Um, and they have to be in order to engage uh, on, in, on the landscape scale. And so I think the other piece of building a relationship is being okay with the fact that um, not every relationship is going to be uh, perfect all the time, and that your partners in whatever program you're working on um, may have disparate perspectives, but we can come together um, for a solution. Um, and so when you build relationships in a way that, um, you know, and, and I, I don't like to use the term honesty, but a truth about where you stand and respectful of the other person in that relationship or the other groups you're trying to bring into it, that that helps build that foundation for the sustainable future. Um, and so I think it's a, it's incredibly important. I mean, as I see people say, well, we want to partner with you, but only if you give us money or we, we'll partner with you if only you give us whatever. Um, those relationships won't work. It's ones that where people come together, um, they bring their perspectives and their help to the table without having a quid pro quo type of expectation. Uh, and knowing that we're all in it for the long haul, 
um, and there will be disagreements, and disagreements are okay. It'll only make that foundation for the relationship stronger. So I think there's two very important pieces, is recognizing that those partnerships and relationships um, don't have an expectation that everybody is going to get along all the time, what I call the kumbaya syndrome, um, and that we are in it for the long haul. And so you, you formulate that relationship based on um, common ground with those partners. That, you know, that's my perspective on it. Okay. Any of the other panel members just want to riff on what Alexa just said? Yeah, Matt, this is John. Um, I couldn't agree more with what Alexa said, and I think the one thing I would add for folks is to realize that this does take time. Uh, so you need to be patient. Uh, we spent 10 years planning the MSCP, and some of those meetings that we had, those planning meetings were brutal. They, they were a negotiation, uh, everybody came in with their own bias and perspective, and we had to hammer through all that stuff to get to a point where everybody could live with the result. And uh, once you get to that point, though, um, you forge those relationships through that conversation, and then you start going outside and doing something on the ground, uh, you'll find out that um, the implementation is not the hardest part. So uh, it's just be patient uh, and like Alexa said, make sure that you um, are telling folks uh, what you can live with. Uh, make sure that you all come to agreement. You feel like when you come out of there, no one's gonna get everything they want, but at least you can live with everything that, uh, that you've got in that piece of paper. So, again, thanks, John. Uh, Jim or Bill, do you guys want to touch on that or do you want me to? I, I was going to maybe sharpen the question or the conversation just a little bit. Well, this Jim, is Jim. I'll add, some, I'll add something real quick. You know, one of the successes of the MSCP and, and some of the other more successful broad-scale conservation partnerships that have been made uh, very recently, Pima County did their own MSCP. Um, I think one of the keys is, is that given the, the issue of personnel turnover, which is a constant, having a written plan that, that will transcend those, those changes in personnel that was mm -hmm. developed, as, as hard as it is to, to develop these, that it's the way that, that you pave the path forward. Um, earlier, Bill spoke about the Chiricahua leopard frog. Well, the backbone of, of that program is partnerships, but it's partnerships that are embedded in a habitat conservation plan um, that provides uh, protective measures for people that want to enroll and allow frogs to be on, on their property. So it, the importance is that you don't change the rules of engagement halfway through the game and, and developing a sound MSCP or, or a HCP document that's clear, that articulates what's to be done and who's to do it and what benefits there are to doing it, I think is one of the keys to, to these partnership development, uh, particularly working around endangered species. So Jim, let me just build on that. Um, and Bill, you can certainly chime in here whenever uh, you like, but I, I'm, I'm just curious about the question around what compels people to come to the table? And in John's remark on the lower Colorado, he said they have, you know, several several people, 50, 60, 70 different people and organizations at the table, and that they're there and that they're fully engaged because they have an identifiable state both in the process and in the outcome. And so that's clearly one compelling reason uh, why people might engage in these collaborative partnerships and build the relationships because it does take a lot of time and effort. But I'm just wondering, Jim, if you have any thoughts or if maybe, Bill, you have any thoughts in terms of how, what can we do? Is there a role for the ESA itself? Is there some other set of incentives to bring other outlier 
stakeholder groups that might have a predisposition to litigate, uh, whether it's in mass or otherwise, how do we get them to the table? Do they have a compelling interest or are they satisfied with what they're doing through litigation, the justice system, and, and that particular role? So it's a question around what compels people to come to the table? Uh, you know, my only experience um, directly with that was with the Jaguar, and, and you know, we had a recovery team, I think that's what it was called, uh, that met for several years um, discussing, you know, the ways that we could we could protect Jaguars uh, not only up here but, but down in their core habitat in Mexico to the extent that that was feasible from here. And... Uh, the uh, and I'll, I'll use the name since I used it before. The Southwest Center was part of that, but but it became clear that when they didn't weren't going to get everything they wanted in terms of having a map that that showed you know all the places jaguars had ever been any time in the past, and saying that that was where you know, that was our goal was to get them back there, ignoring the fact that interstate highways and a lot of other things have happened since jaguars were ever anywhere near the Grand Canyon, for instance. Um, when, when it was clear that they weren't going to get there right away, uh, they dropped out and, and, and went back to what they do. And so, uh, you know, I think, I think um, when you have a group there that's holding, you know, a, a guillotine over your head while you're trying to do this, it's, it's very discouraging to the other participants. Yeah. And, and um, yeah, I think they're quite comfortable doing what they're doing. Uh, everybody's making money doing it. And... Um, and they're making more headway, and they're actually driving, as, as was pointed out uh, earlier, they're driving the process. The money's not going towards uh, recovering any species. Uh, it's going towards dealing with all this litigation, uh, and, and that's, what, that's what's warped the act. I think the act could work well if, if it wasn't being used in the fashion it's being used. Uh, I have, we have a wonderful uh, relationship with the Fish and Wildlife Service. The Malpai Borderlands Group has a wonderful relationship with them. Nevertheless, um, we're very, very suspicious of anything that they say in terms of what the future might bring because they aren't driving the process. Litigation is driving the process. And as long as that's the, f the case, it's going to be very hard for landowners to, to have enough trust to, to make themselves vulnerable uh, if they don't have to. And therefore, anything you do in terms of, of recovery of species is going to be uh, hampered by that um, actuality. So, Jim, did you want to jump in on that or can I ask Bill a follow-up? You know, let me, let me answer real quick and then you can okay. follow up. You know, we're fortunate in Arizona. We have two, I think, stunning successes where such a broad diversity of people have come to the table to, to work together. Um, the Four Forest Initiative is a the, the largest land treatment uh, that I am aware of in the American Southwest. And it's absolutely controversial because of the, the fact that it entails timber harvest. So. The, that by its very nature um, brings out high emotion. The collaborative that was formed around the Four Forest Initiative uh, included um, many of the organizations that, that are often referred to as environmental litigants. Uh, Four Fry Phase One came through. Uh, the EIS was completed with one very, very small objection. Uh, that was quickly and easily resolved. So it, it can work. What brought people together in that instance was the the first was the Rodeo Chetiskai fire that burned a half a million acres, and the second was the Wallow fire that built a little more, burned a little more than a half a million. So there's there's that exclamation point on the need to do some things, and that brought people together. Um, one of the things that why I think people come to the table in some of our pre-conservation uh, actions is, for example, the CCAA, the Candidate Conservation Agreement with Assurances. Uh, if people enroll and, and meet their obligations 
um, they're they're given uh, protection against uh, accident, inadvertent taking of, of that listed species. So they're they're willing to come to the table for those protections and and build conservation into their program. So I guess there are multiple reasons why you come to the table. Um, some of it is protection against ESA. Uh, some of it is, I think, almost everyone that's involved has an interest in conservation. It's just sometimes a little bit different uh, on how you want to get there, but it's a need uh, and to brought to uh, carry forward conservation. I think is one of the biggest things to bring people together. So let me follow up on that with a question from one of our audience members. Um, and maybe a slight adaptation of the question. But it's a, it, the question has to do with whether there are existing federal policies, programs that can, that can and do promote and support these kind of collaborative conservation, the pre-conservation things, Jim, that you were just talking about. Um, and or if you had, if there was one thing that you could change, whether it's with respect to the ESA or a, another federal policy that would lead to more of the kind of pre-listing conservation efforts, uh, more of the collaborative uh, sorts of conservation, what would that be? So what are, are there existing, so it's sort of a two-part question. Can you put your finger on a single federal policy that's helpful in terms of promoting and supporting, and I guess for that matter, or, or, or it's, it's a serious problem? And the second part of the question is, if there's one thing you could change with respect to the ESA or other federal policy, what would that be? Alexa, do you want to start? Sure. Well, um, um, so, um, you know, I think there are certainly some opportunities with individual uh, policies, as, you know, Jim pointed out in his presentation, you have um, hopefully you can do a CCA or CCA depending on uh, your status. Um, you know, what I look at when I first became director, I was not very familiar with the HCP process um, and looked into that. And um, that's an exciting possibility, but for the fact that you have to have a listed species. Um, you know, as you're working through that DHCP. So I think there are probably bits and pieces um, that live out there. I'm, I'm most familiar with the CCA and CCAA concept, and those um, do afford the ability to get the partnerships, to get the partners to come to the table. But I think the comment that Bill made earlier um, about there is some hesitancy to come to any of the programs and, and engage because of the, uh, I guess you'd say, tagline of ESA um, is an important point. Um, people have a hesita hesitate to come to the table no matter what the program is because they fear that, um, you know, they're going to be uh, handcuffed um, uh, as they move forward in, in trying to implement an, any type of program. So I'm not sure that there's any one particular policy that I can point to that's more successful than another because I think it really does um, depend on the, the habitat or the landscape that you're working on. Um, but I do believe is that there needs to be a little bit more flexibility and ability to be adaptive um, in those management programs. I think, you know, you hear so often, well, you can do this only if A exists or B exists or whatever it may be. So um, I'm, like I said, I'm most familiar with the CCA and CCAA programs, and, and those are um, a great opportunity to bring folks to the table, but there's always that kind of dangling issue of what happens if those species get lifted. Um, so. I, I'm not sure that there's one in particular that I can look to and say that's the silver bullet that we need. Okay. Let me go to John, see if John's got any insight on this question.
Yeah, uh, obviously I'm going to uh, have a little bit different um, thought process on this since I run a big partnership that has an HCP that allows us to do some things. Uh, there are parts of the ESA that do give you some of that flexibility. Uh, Alex is right, you're not going to go through and do an HCP unless there's some ESA pressure already on you. Uh, but that process um, allows you to expand beyond what's currently listed. So I had mentioned we have 26 covered species. There were 31 species we actually do work on. Uh, only six of them were listed when we began the pro when we began the program in 2005. There was an, uh, one of the species became listed about a year and a half ago. That's a yellow-billed cuckoo. Uh, but we were doing work already on it. It was a covered species. And so when it became listed through Section 4 of ESA, you are allowed to, um, uh, and we did write a letter to the Fish and Wildlife Service that said that our program is already providing the conservation for this species in our area. Uh, so we don't think that you need to make critical habitat here because it isn't adding to the conservation value from what we're already doing. Uh, so it gives you some flexibility to do that. Um, as a federal person, the, the one thing I would love to see change is to have the federal agencies be able to do that because under Section 7 of the Act, we only deal with currently listed species. It's that Section 10 part that the non-feds can do that allow you to do that HCP process. Uh, so federal agencies have a tendency to get more hamstrung and have to do that traditional kind of reactive approach to endangered species. You know, we have a project and here's what may be in the area and the Fish and Wildlife Service then tells you uh, what you have to do to offset those impacts. Though we have negotiated with the service and get what's called a biological uh, conference opinion uh, instead of just get a directed biological opinion. But, um, but there are some opportunities. The, the problem is you do have to look at it as a big, large landscape and can get non-federal participation to be able to use some of that. Okay. Jim, uh, you had talked about in your uh, opening remarks about clarifying the role of Section 6. I think Alexa talked about that as well. Um, or, yeah, Alexa. And, and then also about moving away from in mass listing. So I'm just, without getting sort of caught in the weeds, I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on sort of specific reforms or suggestions in federal policy and or the ESA to achieve those objectives. Well, I'm going to answer the second part first. And there was a yep. rule that was making its way through uh, Fish and Wildlife Service uh, process that would have required individual petition for each species. Um, I am not sure where that is at right now. Alexa may well know more than I. But that was a real, I think, a positive thing because at that point of time, it, it would require some forethought uh, before you petition. When you can petition in, in, with a, a large number, uh, again, that, that makes it very difficult to bring full uh, science to bear, the best science to bear. So, you know, the implementing the rule that, that, lists, that requires listing one at a time is certainly uh, a big issue. As it pertains to Section 6, um, I try not to practice law without a license, but I find myself doing it every once in a while. Um, the, the issue of Section 6, it depends on, on the perspective of, of who's looking at it. Uh, I believe that almost uniformly state wildlife agencies see Section 6 as, as that. If we sign the full authorities, what's called a full authorities agreement with the Fish and Wildlife Service, that puts us on a par in decision making with the Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, I see that interpreted differently by different uh, decision makers in the Fish and Wildlife Service. So a, a uniform direction on what Section 6 means puts us all on uh, an equal understanding. And, and I've seen some significant conflicts arise 
over what Section 6 means and, and what role the states authorize. So, um, you know, a, a single petition approach and a clarifying rule on what Section 6, what, what level of authority that, that allows the states to have would be uh, two things I think would certainly help. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, let me finally go to Bill on this question. Uh, in terms of uh, what's working with respect to federal policy um, and or if you have a suggestion on one or two areas that could be reformed. Well, um, I'm on the board of the uh, Western Landowners Alliance and, and actually they, they put forward, and I don't have it in front of me, uh, 17 pages of um, suggestions of, of what could be done. Uh, and most of them have to do with, with uh, feedback coming in from um, projects like the Mount Pipe Borderlands Group where, where we've, uh, you know, tried to work through some of these things and, and where we've had roadblocks. One thing that's needed is, is, is some kind of single landowner tool that would protect the landowner under both ESA and EPA. So you're not, uh, you're not being punished for being proactive and trying to be cooperative and trying to, to uh, find a, a solution to whatever issue a particular species has to have. And in some cases, you're dealing with several species on the same landscape. Uh, maybe on your particular ranch, uh, there might be uh, conflicting things. Maybe uh, prescribed burning helps one species and, and uh, to the detriment of another. Uh, and the landowners, or, or oftentimes it's a, it's a federal permittee whose uh, livelihood depends not only on the private land but on the land that they lease uh, from the federal government or from the state. Um, and, and, and there you're really getting whipped around and you're not even in many cases allowed to be part of what's going on. Um, you know, you, you, you can be punished for, for holding your head up. And, and I know when, when I agreed, because the picture of the Jaguar was taken on my federal permit to, to go public with that, um, a lot of people thought I was crazy. Uh, and, and it hasn't come back to bite me yet, but I still worry about it. Um, and, and obviously now, you know, my federal permit's under critical habitat, whatever that's going to mean in the future. Hopefully nothing bad. But um, we, need, we, need a, we need a way for landowners to feel like they won't be punished for trying to do the right thing for an endangered species. And, and certainly the, some of the, the safe habitat, uh, 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 safe harbor, I mean, safe harbor agreement, the habitat conservation plan, the conservation, uh, I never get it right, but the one with assurances, these are, these are all helpful, but uh, as, as one, one tool would be very, very nice if, if such a thing is possible. Um, okay. So that, that's that's one okay. that I would put forward. Uh, help, you know, financial. Again, I agree with Ms. Sandoval that you don't go in making demands on the front end, but in, in the course of discussions as you find that that a particular landowner is taking the brunt of whatever it is and it's it, they're out of, you know, it's out-of-pocket expense to try to deal with it, uh, there should be uh, – incentives, uh, easily accessible programs, et cetera, where they can be compensated and helped with doing that. Okay. So, Bill, let me just, since you've got the floor, let me uh, a question from one of our audience members uh, sort of builds on that a little bit, talked about the incentives of landowners and to some degree goes back to the conversation we were having a little bit ago, just about what compels people to get involved in, in these kinds of uh, efforts, and the question is, how do you get landowners to go from shoot, shovel, and shut up to hauling water to save a frog? Well, I think that um, some of it's with, within the individual landowners, certainly, but some of it, I think, came, came in, in this instance from um, the fact that, that we were involved in a collaborative process where we were talking uh, not just across the table with each other, but but actually working on the ground on projects with folks who had previously been considered, we had considered to be our adversaries, and perhaps they considered us the same way, speaking as a rancher. 
uh, I think that gave people uh, the confidence that they could move out and somehow or another we would find a way to make things right, which we always have, although it's sometimes been more difficult than it should be. I think that having a collaborative process in place uh, gives uh, individuals, both within the agencies and, and also the landowners, more confidence to try to work together to do the things that are right rather than worrying about covering the rear ends all the time. Okay. Does anyone want to jump on that, uh, follow that, or I'll ask another question here. So let me go to this next question, another question from our audience, uh, one of our audience members. Um, and I'll just sort of throw this out to the panel, and then I think uh, maybe uh, Bill Whitaker at WJ would like to chime in as well. Do you think the USDA should expand the Conservation Reserve Program to enroll both deeded and leased western rangelands with incentives tied to practices that would support threatened and endangered species on those same rangelands? Matt, this, yeah. this is Alexa. So I, I would like an opportunity to respond to that question, um, if I may. Please go. Uh, so I think <clears throat> any expansion of the CRP program um, can be very beneficial. I, I just very, just a very simple thought um, on any expansion, though, is that while you may be doing that for the encouragement of um, managing for a teeny species on the landscape, there also has to be a recognition um, that there are multiple species and multiple needs that exist out there on the landscape. And, and while I think the view of doing it to help um, protect or further the recovery of a teeny species, it has to be done um, purposefully and thoughtfully so that there can be other uses that are, can occur out on the landscape. So not to the exclusion of um, maybe a livestock producer or uh, someone else who wants to be out there on the ground, uh, the, which offers benefits as well. So I think if that were ever to happen, I think it would be a good thing, but as they if they were ever to expand, expand the policy, there has to be some um, acknowledgement of multiple use out there on the landscape that uh, multiple use does not mean a bad thing when you're trying to manage for teeny species. And okay. so that's, that's all I, I wanted to, to get my point across on that. Yeah, good, good, good. Jim or Bill, any thoughts on that question about the Conservation Reserve Program? Well, I, I don't think the Conservation Reserve Program has ever worked in Arizona, and, and part of the problem, and I think it's, I think you've got it in one of your questions here, although I can't find it right off the head, that is that um, it, it, Conservation Reserve Program has been designed for other parts of the country, and, and it really hasn't been uh, designed for desert landscapes, and so uh, it would have to be redone, uh, you know, to fit uh, the landscapes out here in, other, in, in order for it to be usable. I'm, I, I mean, I sat on a, a, a natural resource conservation board for 25 years. I'm a big fan of NRCS, but uh, sometimes the programs that come down from on high just don't fit this part of the world, and um, Conservation Reserve has been one of those programs. Um, so it, it would need some retooling. Okay. Let me jump in with a thought too. One of the things that I think is is important, and we in the in the resource management world recognize it, is that when you list an uh, an animal or a plant, management of that species has probably failed. And one of the things, uh, playing off what Alexa said, is if uh, CRP funding were used to manage endangered species. We need to be careful that that doesn't divert funding for what I call keeping common species common. And, and if we can keep 
organisms off the endangered species that, that were successful. And that, that has to be one of the drives. And, and funding through CRP is, is a habitat conservation program uh, that I think is tightly tied to keeping common species common. So it's working now. Uh, it could be used, I think, could be adapted to uh, endangered species conservation in the desert, but uh, I think that Bill was right that it would need some conscious changes. But don't take don't take money away from from doing good things today uh, to the focus of endangered species and then create more because of that. So let me follow up with another question here um, related to that, and uh, again, the degree to which CRP can or cannot be adapted to these desert landscapes. Are there other innovative incentive-based opportunities that some or all of you have experienced that you're familiar with uh, that, you know, are working with respect to getting more landowners involved, state agencies involved um, in, uh, in managing multiple species? So are there other innovative incentive-based things kind of emerging organically or coming from states, for example, that you're familiar with? Matt, this is Alexa. So, yeah. uh, you know, I think I spoke earlier in my opening remarks about the range-wide plan uh, for the lesser prairie chicken, and I think that plan does exactly that. It's a voluntary program um, where we have industry um, engaged in um, signing up and, and having some fees associated with the sign up within that program, but then we incentivize out to the landowners uh, management practices that not only benefit the, the lesser prairie chicken, but the other grassland species that exist. Um, and so that's new. I think the range-wide plan um, in bringing industry together and playing uh, sign-up costs and mitigation fees um, and then dispersing those back out uh, to the landowners. And all of this is being done on a voluntary basis. They're not being forced to come into the program. Um, I really see it as a great model uh, for how we can move forward in bringing together um, those folks who are the landowners and, and industry and everybody else who's a user of the landscape. And so um, that program has been, <clears throat> you know, was developed probably about four years ago, but been in full operation for a little over two years now. Um, and so there, that program I'm it, it, very proud to be a part of but also see the benefits when you uh, incentivize um, working with all of the different partners and actually uh, helping to pay for restoration out there on the ground. So I do think there are some unique opportunities and having, uh, you know, being a part of the range-wide plan, obviously, I just wanted to uh, tout the success because it is an, it was viewed as a very innovative a program and still is, and I think there are other uh, programs that are looking at it as a model. It, you know, you can't take it and put it somewhere else and expect it to work. You're, of course, you're going to have to be adaptive in your mm -hmm. use of it, but um, mm -hmm. I think that that program is very successful in, in incentivizing restoration. Okay. Alexa, this is Jim. Uh, you, uh, you probably have more current information on, on the amount of money that's voluntarily come in for the conservation of chickens. Uh, it, it's hundreds of millions, is it not? Um, so we are at approximately $54 million um, over the life of the two-year life of the program to date. Um, and so it's, it's really quite remarkable. Uh, and again, the plug is, is that it's all voluntary. It's, it's just amazing to, to have those partnerships. Okay. Um, John or Bill, anything quick on innovation? We're we're starting to wind down here. Let me just, it's like 10 to 12, so I just want to put out a kind of a last call to our audience members. If you have a question, please uh, send it in quickly. But uh, Bill or John, anything else on sort of maybe non-federal, more innovative, incentive-based approaches? 
Well, I would just say that you, you want to keep uh, the science involved with it. Uh, certainly, uh, when we were trying to get prescribed burning done, we, we one of the things we ran into was that uh, the Palmer agave, uh, the idea of burning the Palmer agave bothered uh, some people um, because uh, it was a uh, food source when they're bolting uh, and they're putting out fruit for the Mexican long-nosed bat, among other things. And the bat was still a listed species, I think threatened species at least. And uh, what we did was uh, get the um, agave people and the bat people together, the experts in the field, which no one had done before. And uh, they, they designed um, a survey uh, where they could actually go into the Pale and Seal Mountains, which is the area we were talking about, and, and see what uh, the bats were actually, uh, what kind of use they made of the agaves. And, it turns out they used a very uh, small percentage of them, and uh, burning actually caused the agaves to bolt, so there was more fruit available for the bats after a burn uh, than there, w there would have been had you not burned. So um, that kind of just put that whole thing to rest, and, and it had a tr uh, more fallout than that because there, was, there were restrictions that the Forest Service had been putting on grazing as a result of, of uh, their this whole issue, and, and those those went away uh, as a result, again, of getting people out on the field and actually seeing what was going on, things that you would expected would have already happened but, but weren't. So um, I would just say it's very important to keep the science involved and focused, and, uh, and most of this stuff was done through private contributions, but we were able to get some federal money once we got the ball rolling. Okay. Let me try and get through another couple of questions from the audience here. There was an interesting one here about how would the lesser prairie chicken model work for the Mexican wolf? So if somebody could very briefly explain what the lesser prairie chicken model is and then how that might apply to the Mexican wolf. Um, so, Matt, just very briefly, uh, the lesser prairie chicken model uh, works um, with no, uh, well, industry comes and signs up with WAFWA. Um, there we are covered uh, through currently right now the CCAA uh, and um, there are some protections afforded to industry um, and they sign up. Uh, there's a sign up fee, uh, an enrollment fee. Um, and then there's some mitigation fees based on where they plan on operating based on some habitat analysis done within the plan. And this is just very much a 50,000 foot view, so I'm not going to get into the details. Sure. Um, and then what happens is we engage landowners who are interested. Uh, we actually have a, a waiting list right now for folks who want to go out and do uh, restoration for the prairie chicken. Um, and so there's very much a partnership both on the industry side and the conservation side. And again, that's very peripheral view of, of lesser prairie chicken. And I find it interesting. Um, I've thought a lot about uh, how we could potentially apply the um, Mexican wolf or apply the, the model to the Mexican wolf program. Um, and there are some intricacies and, and larger issues with um, the Mexican wolf than I think uh, don't exist with the prairie chicken. Prairie chicken, of course, has their own level of uh, intricacies that go with the discussion, but um, it's, a, it's a different type of critter out there on the landscape. There are different uh, industries operating in the area um, and I'm not, I'm not saying it couldn't happen, but I think it would take some pretty heavy lifting to really determine um, who would come voluntarily to the program. That's been my biggest um, okay. concern because of okay. the political um, and social discussions around Mexican wolf. So I think it would be much harder to implement such a model. So if I could, I'm just looking at the clock here. I want to sort of fast forward this a little bit, and I want to ask one last question and get sort of a quick response from each of you and then turn it back over to Bill for some closing comments. Um, this last question is, 
uh, around funding, and it's a really a political question. And so there seems to be some agreement consensus that additional funding is needed to support conservation and recovery. Uh, and that includes everything from agency staffing, technical, scientific resources, collaborative engagement to the delivery of assurance programs, offsetting economic impact to producers and so forth. So the question is, do taxpayers have a responsibility to support conservation and recovery efforts at a sufficient level? And what kind of message about this needs to be delivered to really to state and federal policy makers as well as by state and federal policy makers? So who would like to go first? Uh, this is Alexa, so I'll, I'll take a shot at that one. Um, absolutely, the funding for uh, recovery planning and T&E in general is woefully inadequate. Um, there is an obligation for, I believe, those individuals who uh, influence the implementation of ESA, and those are a lot of folks outside of the Western United States, certainly should be paying a portion of that um, because they are influencing the decisions that are happening. Um, and so how you go about doing that at a federal and state level in terms of um, funding and getting more taxes from those individuals, um, I think we could probably spend several other seminars on that. So. Um, okay. But I do think it's necessary. Um, let's Let me jump in. Talk. Go ahead. Whoever that was. No, it was Jim. Um, I use the Mexican wolf as an example. It was just raised a, a moment ago by one of the, the members, one of the uh, observers. I, 77, depending on what study you look at, the, the vast majority of people support the reintroduction of the Mexican wolf. And right now, the biggest challenge that we face in managing the Mexican wolf is developing an effective compensation program. And there's simply no money there uh, to do that, uh, or very, very little money. The industry, the rangeland producers, would have much less concern over the, the presence of the Mexican wolf if there was this fair and effective conservation or, uh, compensation program. So who pays for it? Uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service has no money appropriated for it. Um, and it comes down to, I think the answer to the question is, is, if society wants to manage the Mexican wolf and other endangered species, the full cost of recovery, which to me is offsetting the impact of, to the local community, needs to be covered by an appropriate funding source. And until that happens, we'll continue to see pushback on programs like the Mexican Wolf. Okay. Uh, real quick, John and or Bill. Yeah, this is John. Um, I think obviously funding is an issue uh, I think everybody recognizes that. Uh, I think one of the ways that you might deal with that is, is really talking about uh, the positive benefits of doing some of this stuff and looking at this whole approach we've been talking about this morning, uh, more of a multi-species landscape level type approach because you do get some um, more cost efficiencies and, and frankly, probably better conservation by looking at this larger approach. Uh, it's always difficult when you do single species management and having to deal with some of the issues that these guys have to deal with. And the cost will go up when you do that. Uh, the ESA has always had kind of a negative connotation as far as economics go. And, and um, you really have to turn that conversation around a little bit and, uh, and get out in front of it. Uh, and that would be my suggestion. I mean, funding is always going to be tight for this type of thing, so. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, John. Bill, any uh, last thoughts? 
Oh, I, I agree with pretty much everything that's been said on the funding side of it. Uh, I don't I don't know how you make people pay for things that uh, that benefit them and, and and someone else is is paying for it and they're happy to see them do it. Um, it's all that's always been a struggle in in in, 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 in almost every case. Um, and and uh, you know it's it's quite easy for people and I'm, I'm not integrating them, but it's quite easy for people in an urban setting to say, you know, we want wolves all over the rural landscape uh, when they're they don't have any don't have to deal with any of the consequences of that. And uh, how you get to them to pay for that, uh, I'm not I'm not sure the best method to do that. But obviously, there's an inequity there that, that needs to be addressed, or this will continue to be rolling a rock uphill um, in this particular instance. And and. Uh, there may be some some lessons to be learned from from other species that aren't quite as controversial uh, as as the wolf uh, in, in dealing with it. But uh, uh, the wolf kind of stands out on their own. I don't know if there's any other species that you can point to that has such a potentially severe impact on on individuals' livelihoods, um, and and there needs to really be some some solution to that needs to be found if we're, if we're going to move forward. Um, in general, you can look at almost anything and say, yeah, it needs more funding. But I think, I think in endangered species issues, often our priorities are a little screwed up in that uh, a, a great deal of resources and funding goes to a very, very few species that are being forced, you know, we're being forced to look at by litigation and, and other equally deserving get, get almost no attention at all. So um, that's... That's something that might be able to be addressed better if 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 there were uh, another form of, of funding that was dedicated to looking at at something besides those hot species, so to speak. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you very very much to our panel members uh, for your time and all of your insights uh, and suggestions. Thanks to the audience members. Um, looks like most everyone stuck stuck it out with us. So thank you very much for what I hope was a stimulating and thought-provoking discussion, and thanks to the WGA folks, and I'm going to toss it back to Bill for some closing comments. Yeah, um, thanks, Matt. Uh, I just want to, I'll keep this brief. I just want to thank everybody for attending. I thought this was a great discussion, um, very, very engaging, very good um, moderation. The panelists were very engaged, and we had some great um, questions from the audience, and everyone stuck around um, till the end. So we really appreciate that. Um, and just a few housekeeping issues before we go. Um, I just want uh, everyone, to remind everyone to look for a wrap-up email from WGA. Uh, uh, after this within the next few days. Uh, the email will contain a YouTube link that you can rewatch the webinar at and a summary of some of the key discussion points that were brought up today. Also, be sure to visit uh, westgov.org to view some of the case studies, best practices, and resources that have been published as a result of the Chairman's Initiative. And please um, tune into some of our future webinars, and the registration link for those can be found at our website. Uh, the next one will be, is entitled Empowering Private Land Over, uh, Owner Conservation, and is scheduled for Friday, April 15th, and I encourage everyone to join us for that. And with that, um, again, I'd like to close by just thanking everybody for a great webinar, and um, I'll see you at the next one. Thank you. Adios.